I'm Holly Svandiori, the director of the Middle East uh, program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, we are delighted to be the co-sponsors of this meeting on the Iranian presidential elections. Um, you have the bios of our two speakers, uh, Robin Wright, former Washington Post correspondent and currently a fellow at the Wilson Center, and Karim Sajodpur, an associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International uh, Peace. Um, we are exactly, as you all know, uh, 10 days away from the presidential elections in Iran. And this is a most unusual election. Uh, for the last uh, quarter of uh, century, every president has won a second term. Uh, but this time, the incumbent uh, may lose. Um, president Ahmadinejad has come under fire for mismanaging the economy and foreign policy for contributing to Iran's international isolation and for clamping down on civil liberties. The president has even complained that all the other candidates have focused on his record and ignored one another's record. And his aides have suggested he may even not take part in the debates planned between the four candidates. The first debate in Iran is going to be tonight, uh, actually probably as we are talking. And the second debate, which is the most interesting one, is between Ahmadinejad and Musavi, is going to be tomorrow night. Um, Ahmadinejad is facing three strong candidates. Mir Hossein Musavi, a former prime minister who has been out of politics for the last <clears throat> 20 years, but has managed to appeal to the unhappy middle class, women, and the youth. Mehdi Karoubi, a former speaker of parliament who has been vocal on the need to protect individual rights, curb the morals police, and appoint women to the cabinet. And Mohsen Rezaei, a former commander of the Revolutionary Guard, who has said he will negotiate with the Americans and appoint, as he put it, a female counterpart to Hillary Clinton and might announce his cabinet choices before the elections. All three candidates have stressed Ahmadinejad's mismanagement of the economy and promised jobs and better relations with the outside world. President Ahmadinejad has the obvious advantage of incumbency. He has distributed money and even potatoes <laughs> to the rural poor. He has engaged in largesse in the provinces and he promises more of the same. He has the power to close opposition newspapers, blogs, and Facebooks. He can, and in some instances, has denied the other candidates airtime on national and radio TV. Conservative newspapers have launched vicious attacks on the other candidates. But there is a sense of malaise in the country and unhappiness with a president who has seemed to move the country from crisis to crisis. The election has generated interest and we may well witness a large turnout. I personally know of many people who, unhappy with all the candidates, stayed home in the previous elections four years ago and who plan to vote this time. Some 30,000 people turned out for a Musavi rally in Tabriz last month and a few days ago, a huge crowd turned out in Esfahan for Mohsen Rezaei. But as it, as, has, as it has been the case in recent Iranian presidential elections, uh, we will probably have no good feel for trends until the moment when the Iranians actually go uh, to the polls. Um, to enlighten us on the issues and intricacies of the Iranian elections 
on the candidates and their platforms, I now turn to our two speakers. Robin, we we'll go first with you, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Holly. Um, I've organized a PowerPoint. I think they can hear me. Um, uh, the 10th presidential election is arguably the most interesting in 12 years since the election of President Khatami in 1997, and for the United States, the most important since the revolution in 1979. Um, it's a revolution that involves many firsts. Uh, for the first time, the Council of Guardians allowed women to register, and 42 did, including several former members of parliament. Uh, for the first, although women have registered in the past, the Guardians Council said they could actually run this time. And then, of course, turned around and disqualified uh, all the women who registered. It's also, as Holly mentioned, the first time you have a debate. And this is the schedule. Uh, their candidates will be uh, confronting each other two by two. So there will be six presidential uh, uh, debates. None of the, there will be no event at which all four candidates will be facing questioners um, or addressing the same questions in any single venue. Uh, of the 475 candidates uh, who registered to run, the Council of Guardians only approved four. And um, as Kali mentioned, uh, President Ahmadinejad, uh, former Prime Minister Mousavi, uh, former Speaker of Parliament Mehdi Karoubi, and the former Revolutionary Guard Commander Mohsen Rezaei. Uh, this is, um, I wanted to talk a little bit for a minute about the spectrum because we talk a lot about reformers and principalists and hardliners and so forth. And I want to give a little bit more definition to the political spectrum. I group um, candidates in four basic categories and you can actually uh, develop, you know, a good dozen of them because the, they're, they go in lots of conflicting directions depending on the issue. But the principalists are the most hardline, and these are reflected um, most of all by President Ahmadinejad and some of his media outlets. Then there are a group of pragmatic conservatives who include uh, uh, Mohsen Rezaei, one of the candidates, as well as former President Rafsanjani. Then there are a group of conservative moderates, and this is where I think um, former Prime Minister Mousavi fits. He's not a reformer, and I think we need to, uh, as we look at the future and the possibility of uh, him as an alternative to Ahmadinejad, take that into account. The only real reformer is um, Mehdi Karoubi, and that's relative. This election is first and foremost about Ahmadinejad, as Holly said. He is the biggest issue. Um, all other candidates define their agendas in terms of his failures and on the economy and the controversies over his foreign policy. Uh, and here's another first. As Holly pointed out, no other, uh, no incumbent has ever lost a re-election campaign. But Ahmadinejad is indeed in real trouble. He is the lonely incumbent. Um, his campaign has also been troubled by accusations that he has used state funds to travel, busing in supporters from one district to another, so he looks like he has big crowds at many events. Local papers have also reported that his uh, government has handed out gold coins, cash, and 400,000 tons of potatoes to rally support. Um, he also faces challenges even from some of his own former staff. This is the former uh, interior minister, um, Mustafa Poor Mohammadi, who uh, publicly came out and announced he would not be voting for Ahmadinejad and accused uh, him of a, a wide array of shortcomings. Um, but Ahmadinejad does remain popular among rural voters, the lower middle classes, as well as traditional or religious families. Um, he also has the backing from a healthy chunk of the Revolutionary Guard crowd. In the final runoff in 2005, when he faced Rafsanjani, he won 62 percent of the vote. The big question, of course, is looming in the background is the preference of the Supreme Leader and whether Ahmadinejad really has his support. Uh, in the spring, in, in a factor that works in Ahmadinejad's favor, um, Ali Khamenei said voters should not elect a pro-Western president. And this was seen as uh, indicating support for Ahmadinejad. Um, some in Iran contend that Ahmadinejad is the most accurate voice of the inner circle. But there are a growing number who also argue convincingly that he's gone too far politically, that he has mismanaged too much economically, and that the Supreme Leader is, at the end of the day, willing to see him lose. 
he's basically running on his uh, agenda, his past record, and he is best noted for his uh, clampdown on all forms of dissent, on press, on women, on bloggers, uh, on, as Holly knows, dual nationals, um, and for strengthening the role of the Revolutionary Guards and the Revolutionary Guard culture that's developed with uh, former commanders and uh, former members, strengthen, strengthening their role in government, the economy, in the provinces, and the private sector. In terms of the economy, uh, he has proposed cutting subsidies that are um, essential to many people in, uh, in daily life in Iran, and instead to give cash only to the poor. Um, he's had such disputes that he's fired six cabinet ministers with economic portfolios and two central bank governors because of uh, differences over how to manage the economy. Inflation is at 28 percent, uh, and the budget he organized is based on $90 a barrel oil, and of course Iran's uh, uh, income now is 45 to $60 a barrel. Uh, in terms of foreign policy, he's claimed credit for Iran's nuclear program, even though, ironically, it was started in the 1980s when Mousavi was uh, prime minister. He also has uh, lashed out at the inter international community on uh, whether it's the UN resolutions um, or questions about the Holocaust, the Holocaust and Israel's right to exist. Um, he has said he's willing to talk to the United States but only if Iran's rights are respected. And at the top of that list is Iran's right to enrich uranium. Um, Amini Najad's comments on the Holocaust have, uh, interestingly enough, become an issue in this campaign over the past week, with sometimes surprising and blunt criticism from other candidates. The second candidate is Mir Hussein Musawi. Uh, and the interesting thing about him in the campaign is he's become known popularly as Mir Hussein, a little bit like Saddam Hussein was referred to as Saddam. Uh, all the polls now indicate that he is indeed, as uh, we've long anticipated, become the leading opposition figure. He was prime minister between 1981 and 1989 before the Constitution was changed to introduce an executive presidency. He also is a Saeed, which gives him religious cre uh, credentials as, uh, since his family is from the Prophet Muhammad's bloodline. Um, he's been out of power for 20 years, and his record is largely unknown to the largest bloc of voters. I was in Iran uh, in March during his first press conference, and the general reaction was that he is very boring, he's very bland, and that he lacks uh, the kind of charisma needed to get people to turn out and vote. His speeches uh, elicited polite applause, but not the kind of ecstatic, um, warm response that someone like President Khatami got in the early, the early stages. Uh, Mousavi has promised to follow in the line of President Khatami, and in a letter uh, to the former president, he wrote, I, like you, believe that the correct path lies in reforms, and include a return to principles and a rebirth. Uh, he's been cast as a reformer, but as I said, beware uh, that label. The current campaign in Iran involves another first, and that's making widespread use of Facebook, blogs, and the Internet. Uh, Musawi has particularly used technology to his advantage, to the point that the government filtered out Facebook after the campaign began uh, officially on May 22nd, which led to such a popular outcry that the government was forced to uh, restore it. More than a thousand bloggers have uh, come out in favor of Musavi. Um, his agenda slogan is a return to stability, a return to rationality. In announcing his campaign, he said, our people are looking for stable management skills and stable policies that can bring them a sense of relief and freedom. And his campaign is the only one with an official color, and you see it uh, all over Tehran and, and the major cities today. It's the color green, um, with many meanings from Islam to the environment. Uh, his platform politically has included releasing prisoners who call for political freedoms, but he has not called for the release of all political prisoners, uh, to disband morality squads and greater social freedoms, and to improve the role of women. Uh, his economic agenda calls for uh, 
economic management. It's rather vague. But he has criticized Ahmadinejad's policy as alms-based or charity-based. Um, in terms of his foreign policy, he calls for an end to adventurism. And he said he would negotiate with the United States if Iran is not re required to pay a heavy cost. On nukes, he has indicated that he wants to end tensions over Iran's controversial program. He used some rather interesting language. He said, having nuclear technology for peaceful purposes without being a threat to the world is our strategic objective. Uh, one of the interesting factors is that former UN Ambassador um, Zarif is now serving as one of his advisors. Um, one of the most interesting things in this election is Mousavi's uh, relationship with the Supreme Leader, because they have a different relationship than with any of the other candidates. Mousavi was Prime Minister when Khamenei was the titular, rather weak, President before the Constitution was changed. Uh, and they, Mousavi and Rafsanjani, had many confrontations with Khamenei, uh, particularly during the war years, um, uh, over policy and and whether to accept um, a ceasefire. Uh, in one of the other subtle indications about where what the Supreme Leader may be willing to accept, he went and visited Mousavi when his father was ailing uh, in March, and that was widely seen as a sign that um, he was willing to do business with Mousavi. One of the most unusual aspects of any Iranian presidential election is the emergence of a wife uh, in the campaign. This is Mousavi's uh, wife, Zahra Ranavard, uh, who's become a fixture at campaign stops and in campaign uh, posters. She's, she's written uh, ca campaign op-eds calling for an end to discrimination against women, even though she's also written essays about the beauty of the veil. Uh, the press has started comparing her to Michelle Obama. She has a doctorate in political science. She was an advisor to President Khatami and was a chancellor at Al-Zahra University. She once invited Shirin Abadi, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, to give a lecture on campus. And she also reportedly, and I don't know whether this is true, spent time in the United States in exile during the Shah's era. As Holly pointed out, Musawi's crowds have been increasingly impressive. There was one poll last week that indicated he may have a 3 to 4 percent lead in 10 major Iranian cities. And 70 percent of Iran's population today lives in the cities, so that's an, an important number. So far, he has won support from important groups that are close to Raf Sanjani, indicating, again, some conservative support. Um, leading filmmakers and clerical reformers like Mohsen Kadivar. The third candidate is Mehdi Karubi, uh, the former Speaker of Parliament. He ran in 2005 and came in third. He is the oldest candidate at 72, and that's two years older than the Supreme Leader. Um, Iranian analysts this week described him as a firebrand uh, cleric, a cross between Moqtada Sadr and Santa Claus. Um, Karubi, as I said, is the only cleric um, and the only reformer. In some ways, he's kind of the anti-cleric cleric. Uh, he would take the strongest positions against uh, those of, of the hardline clerics. And he has some interesting support from Iran's leading um, philosopher and the father of the the intellectual father of the reform movement, Abdul Karim Saroush. He also has support of both uh, the st largest student group and the largest group of university graduates who came out of that activist student group. He is clearly the dark horse. I've talked to some people who, because he's taken very strong positions, including a series of policy papers, have been attracted to, um, uh, to voting for him. Politically, he calls for freedom of speech for all and said he would welcome criticism, public and open criticism, of his administration. He talks about releasing all political prisoners. He's promised to appoint women to cabinet and to ease social restrictions. He's very critical of the Islamic courts, particularly on the issue of the death sentence and the types of death sentences uh, passed on young offenders. Uh, he's also very critical of the Council of Guardians and has indicated that he would uh, change some of their powers or would favor change. 
Um, on economic policy, he's talked about offering so shares of the petroleum is industry to the people. And on foreign policy, he talks about ending Iran's isolation through detente with the West and being m both more transparent and more rational uh, about Iran's nuclear program. His campaign manager, um, a vice president under Khatami, has been quoted as saying that um, Iran should not waste the opportunity of dealing with the Obama administration because Obama would be capable of rallying greater worldwide support against Iran if diplomacy fails. Um, Karubi has also acknowledged the Holocaust as a fact, and he said uh, in, in a slight against Ahmadinejad that denying it is of no benefit um, to Iran. Um, but Karubi also reflects the limits of the reform agenda. He talks only about political and social and economic modifications and not about any serious overhaul of the Islamic system. The final candidate is Mohsen Rezaei, who registered to run as a presidential candidate in 2005, but withdrew on the eve of the election to avoid splitting the right-wing vote. He also has political credentials because he is uh, secretary of the Expediency Council. But he's also one of six people Five Lebanese or five Iranians and one Lebanese wanted by Interpol for uh, connections to the 1994 bombing in Argentina of the Jewish Center, uh, center which killed 85 people. In a bold attack on Ahmadinejad, Rezaei said the presidency had made him hallucinate um, and think that he could lead the world while being ignorant of the immediate problems in the country. Uh, Rezaei represents the opportunity for conservatives to uh, remain loyal to their principles but not vote for Ahmadinejad. His agenda uh, includes uh, criticism for the current president for taking Iran to the precipice. He wants to, to formalize political parties, which today remain quite informal and quite prolific. There are over two dozen um, conservative parties alone, over 18 uh, reformist parties. He wants to reduce military service from two years to one uh, to, and to incorporate ethnicities in his cabinet. Um, his economic agenda is less squandering of oil revenues and better economic planning. And he wants to develop uh, Iran by easing relations with the West. In terms of his foreign policy, um, again, he talks about less confrontation with the West. And he said on the issue of the United States that he advocates neither surrender nor adventure and noted that the two countries share many regional objectives. Uh, on nukes, he talks about uh, the idea of a consortium, very vague, but the idea of trying again to come up with some kind of compromise. Um, Rezaei has uh, had a meteoric rise in the military. He became a general at the age of 27, and before he was 30, became commander of the Revolutionary Guards, a position he held for some 15 years. Um, he is part of the broad Revolutionary Guard culture uh, in Iran, and we should not assume that the Revolutionary Guards will automatically vote for Ahmadinejad, because Rezaei played an active role in leading um, the war effort whereas Ahmadinejad was a trainer and teacher during that period. Um, one of the things that struck me in reading over all of their positions was how nationalist so much of the language is. And there have even been references to Mohsadeh um, in the campaign, which I found very interesting. You don't hear a lot of talk um, about the, the revolution. The issues beyond Ahmadinejad um, center around uh, three major ones. Uh, obviously, the economy. Inflation is 28 percent. Employment officially, unemployment officially, is 13 percent, but probably at least 18 and maybe 20 percent. Um, sanctions, especially over the past two years during the banking sanctions, uh, have taken a real toll in Iran. Uh, the price of produce has tripled under, uh, under Ahmadinejad, and housing prices have at least doubled. Um, Iran has earned 75 percent of its oil revenues since the revolution during Ahmadinejad's term in office. In other words, the huge, vast majority of income. But Ahmadinejad making, calculating um, that the price of oil would remain high uh, spent most of the oil reserves. And there, 
the controversy is over how much uh, it, he's down to, but of over $80 billion, um, it's, he's estimated to have spent somewhere, all of it except for 8 to $25 billion, and probably closer to the lower amount. Um, another issue is women, one of the two most important voting blocs in Iran. Each candidate has staked out a definite position on women, and that's, again, another first. Women are very active as campaigners, and several groups have formed a coalition to demand that the candidates pay attention and to demand for uh, legal equality. The third issue is Iran-U.S. relations. Um, and all four candidates, again, have staked out positions that favor negotiations with the United States. Again, another first. Um, they all want better relations with Washington. And to get beyond the tensions of the past 30 years that um, are reflected in the fading graffiti on Tehran's walls, uh, the difference among them is really how to get there and how far to go to achieve them. There are two issues that are non-issues in this election. Um, and the first one is Iran's controversial nuclear program. For all their differences on Ahmadinejad's uh, policies, uh, all the candidates back continuation of uranium enrichment. Uh, Iranians are adamant about that right. Um, but it is true that the emphasis, the atmospherics, the climate, the style, and the civility of both foreign and domestic policy could change enormously depending on who wins. Um, the second issue on which there is no dispute is the form of government and the survival of the Islamic a republic. Over 30 years, there has been a shift from the rhetoric of revolution and the billboards showing martyrs from the eight-year war with Iraq, um, which have increasingly been replaced by advertising billboards, uh, many of distinctly non-Iranian products with non-Iranian actors. Um, but all the parties want uh, maximum voter turnout, not just to help their own cause, but as a signal that, as an endorsement of the Islamic system itself. Um, the election factors, uh, again, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, there are two blo voting blocks of importance, and youth will be arguably one of the big ones despite government attempts to limit their impact. The government has now twice lifted the age, the voting age. In the early days of the revolution, it was 15, it was uh, raised to 16, and now it's 18 because of the huge demographics. Um, uh, most, many of the young um, uh, back Musavi, uh, particularly the students. But there is a controversy in Iran about the issue of the bus siege, uh, the young volunteers, the paramilitary forces. Uh, the Revolutionary Guard, the current Revolutionary Guard chief, said last week um, that bus siege participation in election activities uh, was legal and to be encouraged, and this is clearly a boon to Ahmadinejad. The second block, as I said earlier, are women voters um, who are increasingly voting um, independently. Women are a major, were a major factor in the election of Khatami and supporting the reformists. Um, Iran's very brief, oh, this is um, one of, uh, again, one of the, the women um, uh, campaigning at a Musavi rally, her green hands um, and saying females are, male, females are equal in rights to males. Um, Iran's two-week campaigns are always very intense, and this campaign already features more diversity uh, and open criticism than any previous election campaign. At one Musavi rally, the supporters chanted, death to the Taliban, whether they're in Kabul or in Tehran. Um, the government um, has actually set up banners around town. This is a first. Uh, for people to write graffiti. Uh, this one happens to say, um, uh, our love, uh, Amadi, our love. Um, but I'll, let me conclude by saying, uh, beware assumptions. All clergy, for example, are not either hardliners or necessarily going to vote for Amini Najad. Karubi is a cleric. Many in the establishment in Qom don't like Amini Najad and disagree um, with the supreme leader. 
Uh, there are 46 million voters in Iran. Ahmadinejad can probably count on 13 million. Karubi has probably over 4 million based on past voting patterns. The higher the turnout will help uh, Musavi and the others. The lower the turnout, it will help Ahmadinejad. Um, and I suspect that for Ahmadinejad to win, he will have to win in the first round. If there's a runoff, I would bet that he will um, probably lose. Um, but nobody's gotten the election right. And I got this uh, analysis from the Council on Foreign Relations on the eve of the vote in 2005. And if you notice, all you have to do is read the red part. Considered by polls and pundits to have little or no chance of winning, and the person at the top of the list is um, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Um, uh, the runoff is likely to be on, um, well, Holly and I have different dates. I, my understanding was it was on the 19th. Um, Holly thinks it's on the 26th. But anyway, it will be soon after. Sorry? I think it's 19th. Yeah, it's 19th. Um, uh, after the election. Um, and then they have to face the very tricky business of um, dealing with the United States. And I will end by saying um, uh, there are many obstacles ahead. And I think in this one, uh, Obama has his work cut out for him because I think the Iranians have the trump card. And with that, I'll hand it over Thank to Karim. You, uh, Robin Karim. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I think we've tried to recreate Tehran for you today by turning up the temperature in this room. <laughs> yes. um, what I thought I would do is attempt to address four or five questions. I'll touch a little bit on the candidates, but I think Robin's analysis on with regards to the candidates was spot on. Um, then I'll attempt to address this question of how democratic these elections are, what impact they might have, um, what role is there for the United States, how should the United States react, and predictions. Um, and in terms of candidates, just very briefly, I thought, again, Robin's analysis was spot on. and. Uh, Musabi, as we all know, is the primary uh, challenger to Ahmadinejad. And over the course of the last couple of weeks or so, I've often seen analogies calling him Iran's Obama, which I think, as Robin uh, said very accurately, uh, he's certainly not Iran's Obama when you look at his political views, his temperament, his character. Uh, he's certainly, I think, not capable of inspiring that type of movement. Um, to put him in the context of domestic U.S. politics, I think of him as Iran's Bob Dole, um, uh, in the sense that he's someone generally well regarded, but not really uh, able to inspire a massive popular movement. And he's also Iran's Bob Dole in the sense that he's considered a two for one package. As you remember, Bob Dole's wife, Elizabeth, was considered uh, a two for one package. And as Robin mentioned, um, uh, Musavi's wife has turned out to be a real asset for him in terms of being able to attract uh, female voters. I, I would mention one thing. And that is that Musavi is the only ethnic Azeri uh, in this race between the four candidates. And as we saw in 2005, there was an, uh, a candidate from Iranian Azerbaijan who actually turned out, he had a very good following, good, very good turnout in Iranian Azerbaijan, which is about, uh, Azeris compose about 24% of Iran's population. So that could help uh, propel Musavi to the second round if he has a strong turnout from Iran's Azeri community. Now, Mehdi Kadrabi, I, I thought uh, Robin's description of Kadrabi as a, as a maverick is right on. He's kind of a combination of a maverick uh, and a populist. Uh, if, you want to, um, uh, if you want to be accurate, I, I would argue that he does have bolder reformist positions than Musavi. When you look at a lot of his positions with regards to human rights and democracy, he's taken a bolder position than Musavi. I think Musavi's main asset has been the endorsement of President Khatami. But I think had President Khatami endorsed Kadrabi, the race could be much different right now. Um, in terms of how I would see Musavi in the American context, I think both considering his age, he's 70, 72, and his temperament, I kind of see him as an Iranian John McCain. Uh, he's someone who's known to challenge, one of the few politicians in Iran known to challenge uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. And you know he has this reputation of um, uh, an Iranian from Lodistan, uh, from the central part of the country, who are considered quite headstrong. And I would just add that I, I wouldn't count Karubi out. Uh, I think he's someone interesting to keep your eye out on. Last time, in 2005, 
uh, everyone counted him out, and I think had it not been for improprieties, he probably would have beaten Ahmadinejad in the first round uh, after Rafsanjani and gone on to the second round. Now, uh, Mohsen Rezaei uh, is a highly ambitious former commander of the Revolutionary Guards. Um, I think he, uh, of the four candidates, he's the one with the least amount of popular appeal. Um, he has kind of a, an intimidating demeanor, and given, again, his background as a Revolutionary Guard commander, I think he doesn't inspire uh, young people uh, in Iran. Um, a lot of my friends in Tehran say he's very aesthetically unappealing. Um, those of you in the media, uh, as we say in the media, he's got a face for radio, uh, <laughs> although <laughs> that didn't uh, count Ahmadinejad out in 2005. Um, and, you know, in the U.S. context, I see him somewhat akin to uh, some of you remember, may remember Alexander Haig, who was uh, Reagan's Secretary of State, who was also a very highly ambitious former soldier. Uh, but Reza could have an interesting role in this election in, in, in terms of similar to the role that Ralph Nader had in the 2000 uh, elections. That he, he, no one expects Rezaei to win, um, but I think a lot of reformers are happy that he's running because he could steal votes away from Ahmadinejad. Lastly, when it comes to Ahmadinejad, uh, as Robin said, he has the ostensible support of the leader. Um, he has the, uh, essential, essentially the backing of state television. Uh, a lot of Iranian analysts and even a few officials I've spoken to say that he has a huge advantage in terms of his access to state funding for his campaign. Um, his constituency is the pious poor. Um, uh, so, you know, the urban sophisticates in, in Tehran and elsewhere that have access to satellite television and the Internet and are not going to vote for them, he, he's not interested in courting them either. He's visited the provinces more than any Iranian president uh, since the revolution. And he's banking on the fact that voter turnout in the provinces is, all, is oftentimes much higher uh, than in the capital. I think last time around, voter turnout in the provinces was somewhat, what was somewhere along the lines of uh, 75, 80 percent, whereas in Tehran, voter turnout was 50 percent. Uh, so he's banking the, on the fact that uh, in the provinces, his constituents are going to come out in droves. Um, again, if I want to follow the pattern of, of putting Ahmadinejad in a U.S. Domes domestic political conte context, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, to think of who, you know, who he compares to uh, in the U.S. context, but I was reminded of this old joke from John Stewart who was talking about Dubai, and he said that Dubai is what happens when Las Vegas and Saudi Arabia have a baby. Uh, uh, and I, I, I thought that Ahmadinejad is kind of what happens where Ayatollah Khomeini and Sarah Palin to have had a baby. <laughs> 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 kind of a populist Islamist. <laughs> now, all, all three... Opposition candidates, as I mentioned and Robin mentioned, Ahmadinejad has the ostensible support of the leader. There have been several statements from the leader in the last couple of weeks which are fairly unambiguous in terms of their support for Ahmadinejad. And these three opposition candidates have all butted, butted heads in the past with Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, with Ayatollah Khamenei, sorry. Uh, Musavi, when he was prime minister during the 80s, oftentimes butted heads with Khamenei. Rezaei was then the commander of the Revolutionary Guards and leading uh, the war against Iraq. And, he had a uh, contentious relationship with Khamenei. And Karubi in 2005, after he lost uh, the first round of the elections to Ahmadinejad, uh, wrote a fairly stern letter to Khamenei, a uh, public letter alleging improprieties uh, uh, from Khamenei's son. And Khamenei issued a fairly uh, stern rebuke, public rebuke uh, of Karubi as well. So I think this could also play a factor that the three challengers to Ahmadinejad uh, have all had this contentious relationship with Khamenei. I think uh, Khamenei certainly sees that he has, a, he has a dog in this fight. Now, how democratic are these elections? This is a question which is oftentimes asked. And I suppose it depends on your metric. Uh, a lot of people, if you're looking at the glass half full, you say, well, these, are more, these elections are more democratic, or Iran's system is more democratic than many countries in the Middle East. You know, in, in Egypt, uh, Hosni Mubarak oftentimes wins 101 uh, percent of the vote. Um, many countries, uh, Persian Gulf countries, you don't even have elections. Um, and, and so by those standards, Iran's system looks fairly democratic. I think this is, uh, I would compare this to what President Bush once said about affirmative action. This is, in my opinion, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Uh, and I wouldn't compare uh, Iran's history and its, its uh, uh, culture and its civilization to some of the other countries in the region which don't have uh, any elections. I think. Uh, a more interesting model comparing apples and apples is Turkey. 
And by that standard, I think these elections in Iran are unfree. Uh, they're unfair, but they're unpredictable. Uh, and they're not, uh, they're not totally uh, rigged, but, but certainly I think that uh, if the regime higher-ups, specifically Ayatollah Khamenei, decide to throw their weight behind one particular candidate, it can make a difference. But again, as Robin said, the, the, these results are quite um, unpredictable. Now, what impact might these elections uh, have? We all know that Khamenei is the most powerful official in Iran. The constitutional authority of the leader dwarfs that of the president. He has control over the main levers of state, the, uh, the judiciary, the military, the media. Um, and, and, you know, when I kind of visualize how power is wielded in Iran, I picture a long table of 15 men, bearded men, and with Khamenei sitting at the head of that table. And when someone like Ahmadinejad is president, all 15 of those men surrounding Khamenei have a very similar uh, revolutionary, Islamist, anti-imperialist worldview. And I think they one-up one another with, with kind of bombastic rhetoric. And if you do have a different president, a more moderate president, someone like Mohammed Khatami or potentially Musavi or Karrabi, around that table of 15 individuals, I think you replace maybe five or six of these hardliners with more moderate uh, voices, reformist voices. So their impact, I think, is not enormous, but it's certainly not negligible. And just a word on, I've been thinking about what I call the, the Khamenei model of governance, which is a great system for him because it's power without accountability. And I oftentimes think about uh, Hamid Karzai in, 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 in Afghanistan, who's oftentimes called the mayor of Kabul. He's someone who, who gets all of the accountability, all of the, the blame in Afghanistan is often placed squarely on his shoulders. Uh, but a lot of the constitutional authority, or a lot of the authority, um, is not in his hands. And I think it's the inverse in Iran, in the sense that over the course of the last uh, two decades that Khamenei has been leader, he took over for Khomeini in 1989. Uh, I think uh, Robin and Hale can probably attest to this, that when you engage people about politics in Iran, uh, it's the president who oftentimes uh, uh, bears the brunt of their grief. When the economy isn't going well, people say, you know, uh, Ahmadinejad hasn't done anything for the economy. If social freedoms and political freedoms haven't been delivered, people say, well, Khatami didn't do anything for us. But in reality, Khamenei is the man uh, behind the scenes who is, uh, has the last word on a lot of these issues. And uh, despite this, because of his low profile, both domestically and internationally, uh, a lot of the power, uh, a lot of the accountability that usually comes with power, um, he doesn't have. And I think if the dynamics change, if, if Ahmadinejad's does get re-elected, and now Khamenei has really uh, uh, kind of very uh, visibly tied his fate to that of Ahmadinejad, you may see start, uh, this dynamic starting to change somewhat, that people start to hold Khamenei a bit more accountable for some of the political, economic, and social malaise in Iran. Now, what about the United States? How should the United States um, react to um, this election? My, First instinct is obviously to say that the United States shouldn't, should refrain from making any comments about these elections. I was based in Tehran in 2005, and I remember uh, President Bush made a statement along the lines of saying that Iranians deserve to um, uh, vote in a free and fair democratic election. And official state media in Tehran had um, kind of changed his words around and said that George Bush says that Iranians shouldn't vote in these presidential uh, elections, and I think people reacted negatively to it. So I think that, you know, given the fact that majority of Iranians still get their primary, their, their, their primary source of information is still official state television, I, I don't think uh, the United States gains anything from um, making any comments. On second thought, I was recalling something an Iranian official once said to me. Uh, he was talking about the debate in Iran about the WTO, the World Trade, or, uh, World Trade Organization. And, and he, he was saying to me that um, he was an economist, and he said, uh, for many years, uh, we were trying to convince the hardliners in Tehran um, that it was a good idea for Iran's economy to join the WTO. And he said, you know, finally, after a decade or so, they relented and they said, okay, it's a good idea for us to join the WTO. And then he said in 2005, the United States finally lifted its opposition to Iran's joining the WTO. 
And suddenly the hardliners in Tehran said, well, if, if America wants us to join the WTO, then we don't want to join the WTO. <laughs> so given that logic, I, I think maybe it's not a bad idea for President Obama to endorse President Ahmadinejad in his upcoming <laughs> speech in Cairo. And if those of you who are reading the transcript of those remarks know that these, that's tongue in cheek. Now, um, predictions. Um, I always tell people that my litmus test for um, my litmus test for kind of um, um, my my faith in someone's skills as an Iran analyst are uh, those who who make bold predictions. I always uh, think that uh, they don't have a long history of of doing this because, as we've been talking about throughout the afternoon, these elections are very very difficult to predict. Um, but what I would look at is, is the last 30 years, last three decades in Iran, there have been several trends uh, in terms of uh, individuals that we've focused on, um, groups which we've focused on, themes which we've focused on, which may um, allow us to kind of uh, 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 make some predictions moving forward. And going back to the first decade of the revolution, the individual focus was obviously on Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, the group focus was on the clergy. And the themes were these themes, obviously, we all remember of uh, uh, revolutionary radicalism, uh, I would say excess, um, martyrdom, the war with Iraq. And after the first decade of the revolution, Khomeini passes away, and obviously war fatigue sets in. And I think there's a new era of post-war reconstruction. Uh, which was associated very much with the individual of Hashemi Rafsanjani. And the group focus was on this notion of Islamic technocrats rebuilding the country. And as I said, the, the theme was post-war reconstruction, uh, rebuilding Iran. Now what happens after that, after about eight years, from 1989 um, to 1997, Rafsanjani was president, uh, then we see uh, nearing the end of the second decade of the revolution, these children of the revolution, as we called them, the young people who um, uh, were born around 1979, were starting to reach their late teens, and they were chafing under the political and social restrictions of the Islamic Republic. And I think it, it created a very fertile ground for a movement like the reform movement, Mohammed Khatami. And again, the individual focus was on Khatami. Uh, the group focus was on the student movement, and the themes were uh, democracy and civil society. Now, after eight years of the Khatami era, from 1997 to 2005, I think the focus of these young people, as, as, as someone once said to me, you know, the children of the revolution, Khatami, um, uh, if you are a young person and you voted for, for Khatami, and you wanted, social you wanted social restrictions lifted, you wanted to be able to uh, walk in the streets with your girlfriend and not um, face the brunt of the Basij. And as he put it to me, Khatami helped these guys get the girl, but now they wanted to marry the girl and settle down. And there wasn't uh, uh, improved economic circumstances during the Khatami era. So the theme shifted from social freedoms and political freedoms to, to economic deliverance. And enter Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in 2005, um, again with the theme of, of populism and economic deliverance. And the group movement was, was the Revolutionary Guards. And what I'm getting at now is, is obvious in the sense that after four years, what we've seen is profound mismanagement, both in the economic realm, the political realm, the foreign policy realm. And I, I think there is a general sense among many that um, one theme which is coming to the fore increasingly, and I think we see this with Musavi's candidacy, is this theme of management, that you know this country has been um, profoundly mismanaged and we need a proper manager. And there's very few people, very few politicians in Iran that have a reputation for being um, a good manager. But judging by the last 30 years, what we've seen is that it usually takes two presidential terms for Iran to correct itself. We see it correcting itself over the last three decades, but it usually takes two presidential terms. So things may have to get worse uh, before they get better. Uh, so I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we now open the floor to uh, questions, please. And uh, yes, please. Uh, could you wait for the mic and identify yourself? 
Sure. Um, and I go back to the with uh, Washington Prism and World uh, Security Institute. Uh, I want to go back, and this is a question to any of the panelists. I want to go back to uh, reading Khamenei. Um, obviously, the three candidates other than Ahmadinejad uh, have an issue, and as you uh, mentioned, uh, they had uh, but it had before in the past, and yet there is the issue of Khamenei and being aligned with Ahmadinejad, yet having this four years of uh, mismanagement. Uh, knowing how he's managed to survive in the past 20 years, Will he be willing to uh, accept any of the other three candidates and just bide his time for the next round of elections, or will he still support Ahmadinejad? Uh, I would say a couple of things. First of all, uh, the endorsement of, of the Supreme Leader has in two critical cases been the kiss of death uh, for the leading candidate. In 1997, Nanti, Nanti Nouri, then the Speaker of Parliament, had the uh, endorsement of the you know, not only the Supreme Leader, but the, the entire conservative clergy. There was no deep split as there uh, is today. And uh, he lost overwhelmingly to uh, the unknown head of Iran's national library system. Um, and I don't think that Amini Najad went in the last election with the Supreme Leader's endorsement. Uh, after all, Rafsanjani was running, and despite the bitterness between the two, I think there was a widespread belief that he would, he would win. Um, so it's not an issue of can he accept it. This is the one thing that's kind of interesting about Iran. The Supreme Leader doesn't have a choice, um, even though there may be, you know, rigging of the election. I mean, people speculate about. Uh, a million votes, three million votes, what's the maximum that can be manipulated? I don't know wh whether it's ever happened. I mean, a lot of people in Iran talk about conspiracy theories. But th they haven't been able to, to rig two important uh, elections um, in a way that would have gone w along with what the Supreme Leader wanted or was thought to want. Eddie? Um, if you asked me that question two months ago, I would have said that, you know, Khamenei is, is, is not an idiot. He's been in power for 20 years, and he understands that the country has been profoundly mismanaged. When oil was at $150 a barrel, Iran was having difficulty economically. Now, with the contraction of oil prices, they're going to face far more difficulties. So I would have thought that, you know, he, he would think it's time to move on. And when I saw, when I read uh, Khamenei's um, response to President Obama and his Nowruz message, I thought the spirit of Khamenei's speech was much closer to Musabi's worldview than to Ahmadinejad's. He wasn't talking populist themes. Uh, he was talking about the need for proper management, et cetera. But over the last two weeks, three weeks, the statements from Khamenei have been uh, very unambiguously in support of Ahmadinejad. And your question is, you know, whether um, you know, is that is that the kiss of death for a candidate, or is it potentially helpful? Uh, again, I would go back to what I said earlier, that his access to state funds, I mean, just access to state funds in this campaign, I think, uh, makes, uh, has the potential to make a big difference. And look at who is running, the, who's carrying out the campaign. Uh, the campaign is, is carried out by the Ministry of Interior, as you know. The interior minister is an individual who is directly selected by Ahmadinejad, Sadeq Masuli. So he's in charge of making sure this is a free and fair campaign, one of Ahmadinejad's selections as interior minister. Then the group which is supervising the interior ministry is the Guardian Council, whose head, the head of the Guardian Council, Ayatollah Ahmad Janati, uh, has actually publicly supported uh, Ahmadinejad. He's, he's publicly endorsed Ahmadinejad's candidacy. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the past is some reflection of the present, but, but I would say in this case, if, if I will make one prediction about this uh, election, I think that we're going to see a lot of accusations of, of electoral improprieties uh, taking place because I think that Ahmadinejad really desperately wants to be president again. His people desperately want to be president again, and I, I see this a real, uh, real fight. Um, yes. yes. Thank you. Max Kendrick with the Project on Middle Eastern Democracy. Um, Mr. Sajapur, you're talking about how uh, external observers, you know, glass half full, half empty, are looking at the Iranian presidential uh, elections and the legitimacy of this democracy. Uh, would you or uh, anyone else uh, sitting up there be willing to comment on how the Iranian people themselves view the validity of their electoral process? It's a very good question, and it depends on where we choose to focus. I think certainly 
um, some of the urban sophisticates in Tehran, uh, where you have high uh, levels of satellite tele television penetration and internet penetration and newspaper, re newspaper readership, uh, whose primary source of information is not official state television, I, I think they certainly would question uh, the, the legitimacy of these elections. And as Holly said in her introduction in the past, they've simply refrain from voting because they say that actually voting is a vote of legitimacy for this regime. And if you don't provide me any of the candidates uh, which appeal for me, why, why should I vote? Um, but I think uh, in the provinces, again, where voter turnout is much higher, they may have uh, um, uh, a different view of things, especially um, in, in many of these provinces, um, the only source of information or people's primary source of information is official state television. If that's the only source of information, I think they see things much differently. I would also add one important thing which oftentimes is not mentioned, and that is that when you go and vote in Iran, uh, you get your identification card stamped. And uh, many people believe, it's kind of an unspoken rumor, that if you don't have your ID card stamped, it can be, detri it can be detrimental for you and your place of employment, especially given the vast majority of Iranians are, are somehow uh, either directly or indirectly employed by the state. Um, this, I think, compels many people in the provinces uh, to go out and vote. Robbie, you want to add something there? Audrey, just um, wait for the mic, please. Is there a mic here, please? Thank you. Henri Baki at Carnegie. Do you, I'm, I'm assuming that Armidi Nejad will be one of, the, if there's a uh, second round, he'll be one of the two candidates. Do you think the margin of victory will make a difference in terms of, will the margin of victory, if it's a very, very close second round, will it create tensions in society? Will there be any problems resulting from that? Because after all, in, in the previous election, he had a, a fairly convincing uh, win. Uh, I don't think that it's going to lead to any kind of visible tension. Uh, I think it might lead more people, particularly among the young, the educated, to try to leave Iran uh, if Ahmadinejad wins by a close vote. Um, I, I just don't see the tension. I, I want to say one thing, though, about, you know, when we make the assumptions about why Ahmadinejad may win a, uh, a re-election, I think we ought to look at why he was elected in the first place. Yeah, I, I just don't see it. You know, I think there'll be a lot of disgruntlement, a lot of accusations of fraud, and, and um, but I don't think visible tension. I mean, breaking something, breaking out in the streets, I don't see it. The, the state has too close a control, and that's why the student movement has never made a comeback, really, since, you know, the late 90s. Um, but I was just going to say one thing about um, all this talk about Amini Najat. I mean, The Economist has now labeled him, you know, that he's say, is predicted, and they may be right, that um, he wins. Um, People went to the polls to vote as much against the clerics and as much against Rafsanjani as to vote for Amini Najad, who was a little-known mayor, considered Mr. Clean, not corrupt, and he was the first non-cleric elected president um, since... Since Bani Well, no, but that's when, after that, um, uh, Khomeini then said that the cleric clerics can run for president. Before that, he said they couldn't. And once, and they, they've been clerics ever since. And I think that, that the Iranians went out and voted on issues of corruption, the clerics, and everything else. And that we need to, be, we need to understand why he won the first time um, when we consider whether he may get reelected. Although when I was in Iran in March, I did ask a number of Iranians uh, whether they thought he could win, uh, given how unpopular and how much grumbling there was uh, about his various policies. And they said, wasn't George Bush unpopular at the end of his first term? Hmm. And he won re-election. Um, yeah, there, there was a um, comment from a, a guy called Ali Reza Ali Vitabar, who is one of the main kind of intellectual architects of the reform movement, someone very close to Khatami, who said that if the reformists want to win this election, they'll have to have five million more votes than the conservative to, conservatives to compensate for any improprieties. Uh, so what I would say is that Ahmadinejad won't lose a close election in the second round. If it's close, they'll somehow manage to get him over the top. This is my own uh, prediction. So if he loses, I think he'll have to win. He'll have to lose by a sizable enough margin that they're not able to bridge that gap uh, with various um, uh, improprieties. Um, 
Um, and, and, you know, how will uh, people uh, react if he were to win? Um, you know, I think that his opponents are not the types of people that are prone to go out into the streets and, and, and fight street battles and, and, and do things like that. So I, I, I think people will certainly be crushed. Uh, there will be a lot of people who will be crushed if he serves a second term. Uh, but I don't see any major uh, tumult as a result of it. Uh, Andre, I think if he loses by a relatively narrow margin, they will ask for a recount. No. And then there is always the possibility of some sort of impropriety. And th this might happen. Um, yes, please, in the back, Mr. Ghada. Yeah. Thank you very much. Fayyabur um, Ghada from CSIS. Uh, my question has to do with intimidation. There's been rumors that. Uh, there's been some thugs going into uh, Rezaei's uh, and Musabi's uh, demonstration uh, rallies. And there was also a rumor that there's uh, 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 gas being do used. You know, these gases have been used uh, in some of these rallies. Uh, have you heard any of this? Do you think uh, intimidation is going to play a major role in the uh, elections? Uh, two things. There are all kinds of shenanigans are going on. There was a torching, I think, at Rezaiz, um, one of his facilities. There have been, you know, damage, uh, small attacks on some of the camp, you know, campaign stations in different parts of the country. Uh, one of the interesting things was this bomb they found on the flight of the Quiche Island Airways from Avaz to Tehran. Uh, they found a bomb in the bathroom uh, what a, a week ago, and. Uh, they've just announced in the last, I think, last day or two that President Khatami, who was on a campaign stop for Musavi, was supposed to have been on that flight. You know, I don't know um, what kind. Of, there clearly there's some thuggery going on. The scope of it, I think, is unclear. I don't have any specific information. I just would say that I, I'm not worried about Reza being able to take care of himself. He's quite a thug <laughs> in his own right. But certainly, uh, you know, in Musavi's camp and in and, and Katerby and other, maybe others who are not prone to these thuggish tactics, uh, it's more effective. W what I am always concerned about is what takes place outside of our, uh, outside of what we can see, meaning in Tehran and Esfahan and Mashhad. Um, it's very difficult for massive intimidation or, or, or massive improprieties because they're fairly, the urban areas and there's informal monitoring taking place. But again, in a lot of the provinces where you, you it's out of eye shot, I, I think that that's where they have more leeway to, to use some of those tactics. Another point I would make is the role of the Basij. Uh, this is what we saw in 2005. I think the Basij played a decisive role. The Basij militia played a decisive role in helping Ahmadinejad get to the second round um, in 2005. And I had some friends uh, who were in the Basij then, and, and they told me an interesting story that it was, it was almost like a calling tree, that the head of the, I think the, the, the leader uh, helped to uh, mobilize the senior Basij commanders behind um, Ahmadinejad, and they called their subordinates uh, and implored them to vote for Ahmadinejad, and their subordinates called their subordinates and implored them to vote for Ahmadinejad. It was a calling tree which I think was able to mobilize a lot of people. So um, in, in a country where you don't really have organized political parties, um, I think the role of the Basij and uh, elements of the Revolutionary Guards can really play a decisive role, not in, in getting someone, I think, the in, in delivering them the election outright, because we're not talking about a huge percentage of the population, but certainly in helping propel candidates to the second round. Can I say one small, uh, add one yeah. small thing? The Revolutionary Guards is a very interesting um, phenomena, and uh, Kareem's very right about the besiege, that they're, you know, they are the Hezbollahis of, uh, of Iran. But the Revolutionary Guards, um, many young men prefer to f serve in the Revolutionary Guards because um, if they have to do their military service because they get off at 2.30 in the afternoon and the guys can then go off and get a second job, which is important economically. Um, and, and remember, a lot of the, the Revolutionary Guards are just rank and file. It's the commander and the commander corps that officers that you have to worry about is that, that hardline element. In 1997, during um, when Khatami won, uh, a Ministry of Islamic guidance official told me that they had taken a look at how the Revolutionary Guards voted and canvassed and found that 84% of them had voted for Khatami. 
which, you know, again, this is beware assumptions about who's going to vote for whom. And I think that's when the leader decided this will not happen ever again. Um, uh, Mr. Just wait for the mic. It's coming here. Honorable Board of CSIS, could you speculate a little on what kind of a deal you think is possible on Iran's nuclear ambitions with Ahmadinejad and without him? Uh, I wish I had a really good, accurate assessment of that. Uh, I think they're all willing to talk to the United States. I think the problem with Ahmadinejad is, as we've seen already during his first term, whether it's the 18-page rambling letter he sends to Bush or his recent effort uh, initiative to offer to debate uh, Obama at the, this fall's opening of the General Assembly, that they're kind of wacky ideas and that they're not within the, uh, the framework of conventional diplomacy and as a result are not likely to go anyplace or make it the process itself difficult, let alone the substance. Um, but it's clear to me that, that, um, that all four of them, whoever, in other words, who wins, uh, would insist on Iran's sovereign right to enrich uranium. And it's the, it's the compromise. I think Karubi, maybe Musavi would be willing to talk um, about some arrangement in different ways. Uh, Karubi more open-minded about a role for the out a foreign community. Um, Musavi willing, you know, taking a pretty tough line, I think. Um, Rezaei, you know, this is where his hard line stripes uh, come out, although he's the one who did talk about a consortium. I don't think they're there yet. Uh, I think that's something that they're, they've put on the table, their, their willingness to talk, but have not indicated in any way that's reliable, how far they're willing to go. Um, uh, David Fromm, who was President Bush's former speechwriter, as you know, once said something which I agree with very much. He said, uh, you can enrich uranium and you can call for Israel to be wiped off the map, but you can't do both at the same time. Uh, and I think that if Ahmadinejad is elected, I don't see him, based on the last four years, as someone who's prone to reflection or introspection. So I don't see him changing his tune when it comes to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And I think given that continued belligerence on that issue, I, I fear that his mere presence uh, could present a, uh, an insurmountable obstacle uh, to confidence building with the United States on the nuclear issue. Now, what Iranian officials often say is they oftentimes invoke this double standard that, you know, India, uh, Pakistan has had these nuclear transgressions. Uh, even. Uh, other countries like South Africa and Brazil have pursued um, uranium enrichment, and uh, the U.S. hasn't had a problem with it. But I always point back again to, to uh, their rhetorical belligerence, and I say to them that, you know, they, they essentially, they, they speak loudly and carry a small stick. Um, they're, all, they're, on, they're on with enemy with this, with this rhetoric. So, so I, I do fear um, that um, Iran's nuclear policy may not change profoundly given a change in the presidency. At the end of the day, I think that's something, a decision which portfolio which Khamenei uh, really controls. But certainly a change of rhetoric uh, could have a major impact on, on uh, the ability to reach some type of a, a modus vivendi with Iran, and I think Ahmadinejad um, doesn't understand that. And just the personnel that would be involved in yeah. diplomacy uh, would make a big, a huge difference. Um, yes, please. Um, we'll get to everybody because we have a lot of time still. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, Gary Mitchell from the Mitchell Report. And I think this sort of follows up on, on Arnaud's question. And I'm going to put it this way, which is that we, uh, we have a saying here that American politics is played between the 40-yard lines. And uh, the question that I'm interested we had a, we had a really interesting, uh, Robin's taken us through this very interesting analysis of each of the candidates and where they stand on issues. Uh, in, in Iran, uh, <laughs> there's got to be a better sports analogy, but it, 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 are, are politics in Iran played between the 40-yard lines? Is it narrower than that? Does it make does it make a substantive difference, not rhetorical, who is elected in this next election on the key issues that are of interest to us, beginning with nukes, 
um, and support for terrorism, et cetera, or are we really looking at uh, a, 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 an Islamic republic um, th that, is, that is not going to move uh, much in one direction or another? What I would say is Karim that um, I think the, uh, the, the, the kind of distinction between um, Ahmadinejad's presidency and Khatami's presidency is even broader than that 40-yard uh, 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 football analogy. I mean, Khatami was calling for a dialogue of civilizations. Ahmadinejad denies the Holocaust. And, um, you know, when you look at the, the, as Robin was saying, the personnel they have working for them, um, a lot of us interacted with people who worked in Khatami's camp. And you could tell that they, they, they genuinely um, were interested in reaching some type of a modus vivendi with the United States. Some of them, their children are even citizens uh, of the United States. And they certainly recognize, they may not have articulated this oftentimes publicly, but they would certainly recognize behind closed doors that this death to America culture of 1979, you know, is obsolete in the 21st century. Ahmadinejad's personnel, I would put in a totally different league in the sense that many of them um, believe that uh, enmity towards the United States was a fundamental pillar of the 1979 revolution and it remains central to the identity of the Islamic Republic. Um, so I oftentimes talk to um, um, the, uh, Javier Solano's nuclear negotiating team and they tell me how profoundly different the interaction was with Khatami's nuclear negotiating team that really genuinely seemed to want to reach some type of a modus vivendi and Ahmadinejad's team which simply shows up and repeats uh, talking points. Let me just add one thing. If he's reelected, I think he believes he will then have carte blanche to do what mm. he wants and that the Jalili and the kind of hardline staff around him um, uh, will become ever, you know, tougher or more entrenched in terms of their position. The thing that was so interesting in the early part of Ahmadinejad years with Lara Jani and Rouhani stayed for a little while, that you had people who had a worldliness. And the thing that strikes you about all of Ahmadinejad's people is that kind of that fear, that early revolutionary paranoia still defines their attitudes on so much. And um, whereas Laura Johnny knows the world, his brother went to Berkeley, likes to claim he has a PhD, but he never did his thesis. <laughs> um, uh, that, you know, there's, there's just a very different category of people who are part of the debate and that's and there is a debate. Even though Khamenei has the last word on everything, he also listens. And that council, that National Security Council, is tremendously important in crafting um, policy. And so I think it makes not just the president, but it's the the, the people who are part of the debate makes uh, make a huge huge difference. And even some of the conservatives, like Laura Johnny, uh, uh, would would contribute a lot because they're willing to engage in conventional diplomacy and not this wild stuff. Lori Johnny has tried to also take some of the responsibility on this discussion through Parliament. You know, has come out and said it's for Parliament to be involved in the nuclear issue. So that might also be the policy if Ahmadinejad is re-elected. Um, yes. And then I'll move to the back. Sure, just see. Um, yeah. um, Ricardo Gonzalez from El Mundo. Uh, one of the most maybe subtle ways to manipulate the elections is through the selection of candidates. Um, I think that in the past elections there were m many more than, than this time, only four. Can you tell me what is the, if you know it, What's the criteria to make this election? <laughs> why, why these four people were there? Do you think that it was a political decision? They were trying to bet who's going to make it in the second round, or I don't know. What do you think? Why do you think we have now these four candidates and not like 10 or 12 or 20 or something like that? God and the Guardian Council know what the criteria is. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this, it's totally, uh, every election, the, the selection of candidates, seem, the criteria seems to vary. Any number of incumbents, in Parliament have been disqualified from running again. It's, um, you know, it's really almost whimsical sometimes. And, and that's, of course, what leaves Iran's political system open to enormous criticism. 
Um, if you recall the parliamentary elections of uh, 2008, was it? Parliamentary elections of 2008. Khomeini's grandson was originally uh, prohibited from, from running by the uh, Council of Guardians. And so this Council of Guardians, they're a group of 12 individuals. Um, they, Khomeini likes to uh, project this facade that they're independent of him, but six of them are directly appointed by him, and the other six are essentially indirectly appointed by him. So I think that uh, I very much view the candidates who are allowed to run as those who are, are palatable uh, to, to the leader. In the last uh, presidential elections, the candidate, the front runner of the reformist Mo'in, was disqualified by the Guardian Council, and then the leader had to step in and said, you know, just withdraw the disqualification mm -hmm. and he had to run, but he didn't make it so that. Uh, Dave in the back, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Dave Pollack from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Thanks very much. Very interesting. I, I'd, I'd like to go back to the statement that Khamenei made that Iranians should not vote for any candidate who wants to have good relations with the West. I think that was what I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, w what does that tell us about <laughs> Iran's foreign policy, no matter who wins this election? Um, and about the prospects for Iran's accepting uh, an offer, you know, the carrots that, that uh, we always talk about. It sounds to me like they, they don't want the carrots, or at least Khamenei views the carrots, that is, the, the offer of better relations with the West, not as a promise, but actually as a threat. Thank I, you. I think he made the statement uh, in context of anyone who he believes is going to sell out to the West, um, not in terms of not dealing with the West at all. I, I don't think that, I mean, he's indicated, and even, you know, you get some politicians who quote uh, Imam Khomeini is saying, we can deal with the United States um, under certain conditions, but we can deal with the West. So I don't think it rules out, but it's, it's clearly a caution about how far you go, how fast you go, and how much you protect Iranian sovereignty and Iranian interests. Um, first, I would commend your ability to pronounce Khamenei, which uh, you would be very <laughs> impressed with that. Very yeah, good. Very impressive. Um, <laughs> what, what I would say is that you know, many of us throughout the years have made this argument that if you engage Iran, you try to reintegrate it into the global economy, you try to reintegrate it into the international community, this is going to facilitate and expedite political reform. And the conclusion I reached after I did this uh, long study of Khamenei is that he understands that argument quite well. And for precisely that reason, I would say he's at best deeply ambivalent, if not downright opposed to some type of a uh, rapprochement with the United States. Now, I think he's not in the easiest of positions because he's presiding over a very young population, which he knows is overwhelmingly in favor of some type of a uh, rapprochement with the United States, two-thirds of Iranians under 32, 33. They have no particular enmity towards the United States. They have no particular loyalty towards this revolution or Islamic Republic. Um, and again, at the, the, the level of the political elite, my years based in Tehran, uh, the vast majority of people behind closed doors amongst the political elite, even conservatives would tell you, you know, it's, it's time to move on. This death to America culture of 1979 is always going to prevent us from fulfilling our enormous expectation, our enormous potential as a nation. Um, so uh, I think that despite the fact that uh, Khamenei may not be interested in having an, an amicable relationship with the United States, or he sees it as inimical to his own interests and the interests of uh, the Islamic Republic, I think we, the United States, should continue to do so, continue to try to engage him uh, in an effort to expose him, basically. Uh, both domestically and internationally. Uh, because during the Bush administration, the argument which many people um, adopted was that the United States was the unreasonable actor in this equation. And, you know, Iran is, is, is very reasonable, but it's the um, kind of the hostile policies of the Bush and Cheney administration, which was the cause um, for this, um, uh, for the animosity between the two countries. And now it's very difficult for the Iranians to continue to hold on to that pretext. 
uh, with the, uh, uh, the Obama's inauguration speech, um, the Nauru's message. All of these things, I think, are going to be very difficult for uh, the regime and for Khamenei in particular to continue to justify uh, this animosity towards the United States. I, I was in Dubai, actually, when uh, Obama issued the Nauru's um, message. And I just remember interacting with several young Iranians there to, to, to see what they thought of Khamenei's response to Obama. And they were very disappointed. They said, you know, the leader of the most powerful nation on earth acknowledged our New Year, uh, the Iranian Nauru's. Do you think that Sarkozy knows when Nauru's is? Do you think that, you know, um, the British Prime Minister knows when Nauru's is? And all our leader said was, first change your uh, behavior, then we'll talk. They were very disappointed in this response. And I know politically in the United States, it's going to be difficult for the Obama administration to continue to justify these overtures to Tehran if the Iranians are not reciprocating. I do think it's the right thing to do, though, to continue to move forward and make it clear to, again, both uh, uh, Iranians domestically and our allies internationally that uh, th they're uh, being the unreasonable party in this equation. Can I add just one thing yes. real quick? Yeah, that, sure. um, I was actually in Isfahan when uh, Obama made his no ruse message, and I went around asking Iranians what they thought. And I was struck by how many of them had, were aware of the fact that Bush had also issued yeah. no ruse messages and um, that this one was different and that he'd reached out to the leaders, but that, again, it was a greeting and there was no substance. And the bottom line was they were all asking, where's the beef? And this gets back to the earlier question about, you know, um, nuclear uh, issues that, and that the public is deeply behind the regime when it comes to the right uh, to enrich uranium. And they want to know what's the compromise the United States is prepared to make on this issue. And when there wasn't, you know, the idea of direct flights between New York and Tehran or World Trade Organization, all this stuff, doesn't really interest them as much as this sense of respect and achievement and having the right to do something that they feel is important, not just for energy, but for development. Um, yes. Farah Simon, American University. Uh, to what extent do you think the regional tensions, such as the recent clashes in Zahedan, could have impact on the election or if Ahmadinejad is re-elected, can we see more of these kind of regional tensions and clashes? Um, I don't uh, see clashes in th – this happened actually in 2005 as well in the run-up. There was um, uh, some tumult in Zahedan and also in Khuzestan. Uh, I didn't see it having a discernible impact on the results of the election. And this time around, uh, they may have some small impact, but I don't think it will be discernible. If we start to see some tumult in a place like Azerbaijan, uh, then and, and you know suddenly there, there's some incident which takes place in which uh, Azeri's sense of um, um, you know discrimination or pride is amplified, then maybe you see more of an outpouring for someone like Musavi. Um, but I, otherwise, I don't see it having a discernible impact. And I, I think more of this tumult probably we can expect to take place, especially uh, in places like uh, Zahedan, where, where there's so much economic malaise and social problems. Yes, in the back, and then this is a Yes, yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ali Ghadib. I'm with Enterprise Service. Um, I'm just wondering, you talked a little bit about the nuclear issue, and if you could address some other areas of Iranian foreign policy, which recently there's been the line taken up by a lot of Iran hawks and people who prefer a hard line with Tehran, that, um, that that's also sort of the, the realm of the supreme leader. And if you could talk about some other areas of foreign policy, whether uh, Kadi Marti hit a little bit upon Israel and Palestine, but the uh, so-called proxy groups in the Levant as well as in Afghanistan and um, Iraq. Thank you. Robbie, go ahead. <laughs> um, what I would say in terms of, first to talk a little bit about the region, the, the Middle East. Um, when you look at these groups like uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, um, was quite interesting when you delve into Khamenei's worldview, is if you were to ask him what's the best vehicle for Iran to assert its ambitions and its hegemony throughout the Middle East, 
the answer wouldn't be a nuclear weapon. The answer would be democratic elections. That's the best vehicle for Iran to assert its hegemony throughout the region because he would say uh, Hezbollah gets elected in Lebanon, Hamas in Palestine, our Shiite co-religionists in Iraq, the Muslim Brotherhood does well in Egypt. So the point I'm trying to make is that uh, Iran's support for these groups, uh, I, I think the Iranians see as, especially Hezbollah, as one of the crown jewels of the revolution. And I think their mentality is why should we stop supporting them uh, because these groups also have um, uh, quite legitimate uh, indigenous support. They're not merely Iranian puppet puppets. Um, so, so I don't see Iran's foreign policy changing in that realm. When it comes to Israel-Palestine, I think I'm very much in the minority on this when it comes to people who think about Iran. But you, you oftentimes hear this adage that Iran, quote-unquote, um, uses the Palestinian card in order for them to transcend uh, the Persian-Arab divide and the Sunni-Shiite divide in order to you know, project regional power. And that suggests they're using this support for the Palestinian cause as a means to an end. Uh, I don't think that that is Khamenei's worldview. I think that he's actually much more earnest than that in his support for the Palestinian cause, which goes back two, three decades even before um, uh, the fall of the Shah. This is something that a lot of these senior revolutionary elite, they cut their teeth as revolutionaries on this issue, and I don't see them abandoning um, their support for the Palestinian cause or their rejection, their opposition to Israel anytime soon, because again, I think that their uh, reading of the Arab street is that the, 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 the I think the current of, of, of history is moving in their direction, uh, that Far more people are sympathetic to Iran's worldview on these issues and on the Palestinian issue in particular uh, in the Arab street than, than certainly to the U.S. worldview. I'd just add something very quickly. Uh, I, I don't think the Arab-Israeli conflict is in any way an issue in this election. Um, only the U.S. and the nuclear program, I think, in terms of foreign policy. Uh, and, in fact, I agree with, with Karim very much on the Palestinian issue. Uh, Khamenei may feel, hardliners may feel, uh, committed to it ideologically, but the majority of Iranians really don't care that much. I, I was in uh, Egypt during the Gaza war and then um, and shortly thereafter in Iran, and the, the reaction is very different. You know, you get a very emotional reaction on the streets in Egypt, and um, Iranians really don't care at all. The one interesting thing is um, Afghanistan, and that's, I think, an area where there is potential for cooperation. They'd really like cooperation with the United States because of the drug issue and so forth. Uh, not so much Iraq, but, um, but again, Afghanistan's not an issue. The regional issues really um, don't, are, not, are not playing this time around. It's the economy, and, um, the U.S., and women. Yeah, uh, just one quick point I forgot to mention. There's uh, an interesting poll which uh, recently came out from uh, Shibli Talhami, University of Maryland, and uh, the Brookings Institute. It's a survey of the Arab Street, which he does on an mm -hmm. uh, annual basis, and, and this year's findings recently came out. And the good news in this year's findings were that uh, Hassan Nasrallah and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad are no longer the most popular leaders in the Arab world. Uh, the bad news is that Hugo Chavez is the new most popular <laughs> leader among Arabs. Okay. I'm going to take two last questions, Mr. Salehi and Bruce Lange. Yes, uh, if you wait for the microphone. It's coming from me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Hossein Ibn Yusuf, International Petroleum Enterprises. Uh, one question for each of the speakers. For Robin, um, what do you think uh, Musavi should do to, uh, for you to consider him as a reformer? I'm not talking about liberal, but the reformer. And a question, a uh, comment on uh, what Karim said. He uh, correctly pointed out a comparison between Turkey and Iran. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, Turkey has actually had uh, almost a century of uh, uninterrupted democratic process. For Iran, it's been uh, actually only two decades after the end of the Iran-Iraq war that Iran had that opportunity <clears throat> to do anything. But are we really satisfied with how the Kurds, for example, over 12 million Kurds are uh, treated? Uh, they're, they're certainly a second-class citizen in, in, uh, in Turkey. Uh, there are other problems, major problems, invasion of Iraq a number of times, the role of the army, uh, how they uh, treated 
the, uh, the issue of hijab for, for ladies. Are, are we really happy with the whole process? Thank you. Now, let's take the last question, too, and then take a Bruce Lang. Bruce. Uh, <laughs> I am Bruce Langan, um, retired foreign service officer. <laughs> this has been a very so useful more. discussion, <laughs> and we thank you all for it. You've all alluded to what I'm asking in one way or another. I'd like to ask each of you to send us away from here today with some indication of what you each think could happen, could be done, that would dramatically contribute to a resolution of this dead heat and see us again talking to each other. 30 years of non-talking, it is appalling. It makes no sense. We all know that. Everybody in this room knows it. And yet we can't seem to get beyond it. Maybe this election will help. God willing, it will help whoever wins. But just off the top of your heads, send us away <laughs> from here today. What would you like to see happen to turn this thing around? Okay, thank you. Robin? A uh, couple of things. First of all, on Musavi, uh, the fact is he takes the line of the traditional conservatives, uh, easing on the economy, on social freedoms, but he says nothing about curbing the powers of the uh, uh, Council of Guardians like Karubi does. He says nothing about changing the political system. He talks about rationality and stability. And that, you know, is there's nothing about a single political opening. And the furthest he goes is that he would free some of those uh, prisoners who were engaged in in statements or activities involving demands for greater freedoms. You know, this is, he's not, he is not a reformer. Um, uh, and I think it's very important to understand that. In terms of Bruce, and if there's anybody in this room who doesn't know this, Bruce Langan was the senior American hostage held for 444 days um, at the American Embassy in Tehran um, and deserves our thanks and gratitude. Um, what, what do we do about breaking the cycle? Look, it's not about what I want or suggest. I will tell you my impression coming away from this trip in March was that uh, an incremental approach trying a strategy that expands the process we had started in Baghdad where our diplomats engage with each other and talk about uh, confidence building is no longer enough that we may be, uh, particularly given the time frame, I suspect it will take some bigger, bolder, more imaginative initiative in saying whether it's on uranium enrichment and let's, let's figure out a way that you can have your sovereign right um, but that the, the world feels confident that you're not going to develop uh, a nuclear weapon, that that's the kind of thing that will pull the rug out from under the likes of Khamenei who may be reticent about engaging, force them then to, uh, because they understand that the population and the world then will see the United States as having made a big enough effort, uh, an imaginative effort, you know, using Obama's, you know, real uh, promise of outreach uh, and can, it would force the, the, the even the hardliners hand. I think anything that begins, you know, kind of small scale, getting a response from the Iranians, yes, we'll meet you, and they meet someplace in Geneva or whatever, even if it's bilateral, um, uh, that we're going to begin a process that the Iranians, and again, it depends on, on who's elected, but that they will, um, that they, they will play us until we actually get to the point we have to deal with enrichment to, actually, to make progress. And the longer that incremental process takes, the further, you know, the further along they get in the process and the more difficult it will be to find uh, common ground because they will, you know, get closer and closer to the threshold. Um, um, with regards to Dr. Uh, Ebni Youssef's question, the comparisons between Iran and Turkey, I, I know I meant to apply that um, Turkey is, uh, is a perfect model, but I would love to have the luxury of dealing with the problems Turkey has to deal with as compared to some of the issues we face in Iran, both in terms of its uh, social development, political development, and economic development. I think it's, it's really decades ahead of Iran, and it's a country with very little natural resources, and it shows you the real difference uh, that proper uh, governance uh, makes. And, you know, Iran, you mentioned Turkey has 100 years of this process. Iran's constitutional revolution just completed its uh, 100th, anniversary, 100th anniversary not long ago. And one thing I would say, and this is certainly meant as no disrespect, but one thing I have noticed is that uh, my generation 
of Iranians, I think, focuses far more uh, on, 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 I think, Iranian shortcomings in explaining the country's underdevelopment rather than with com uh, uh, compared to, I think, many of the older generation who looks as outside powers, whether the United States or the British or others, as the primary culprit in Iran's uh, underdevelopment. Now, when it comes to um, um, Ambassador Langan's question about uh, what can we do to help break the impasse? I think a great start would be Ahmadinejad not getting reelected uh, uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, that would be a great start. Um, but otherwise, I unfortunately don't see any silver bullets. Uh, I don't subscribe to this uh, uh, notion of a, a quote unquote grand bargain um, simply because I, I don't think that um, the Iranians have reached an internal um, uh, consensus that they're interested in the grand bargain. We in the United States may have finally reached a consensus after three decades that it's time to try to turn the page with Iran. I don't think the Iranians have necessarily reached that. The Iranian regime has reached that same internal consensus. And wh what I would simply say is that we need both a top-down and bottom-up approach, I think, to make it clear to the Iranians that we're interested in a broad agenda, a broad strategic agenda with them, discussing everything from the nuclear issue to Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, energy security, et cetera. Uh, but also a top, uh, a bottom-up uh, approach in terms of allowing U.S. diplomats talk to their Iranian counterparts throughout the world. And there was just news of that today that uh, uh, the United States is mm -hmm. going to invite Iranian diplomats to Fourth of July celebrations around the world. So thank you. Okay. I, um, can I just say I, I don't think a single one will show up, um, uh, and especially for hot dogs and Kool-Aid. Uh, but I also was not talking about a grand bargain. Mm. I don't want to be confused. No, I, saying, I didn't think you were. Uh, no. Because I think that's an idea of the 90s, and that's just not, um, not on the cards as a viable solution either. Uh, Robin, the Iranians are very good at surprising everybody. One person might show up at one celebration. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. With that note, I'd like to thank uh, my speaker. <laughs>